So, if you have data, you usually should secure them. And if you have really sensitive data, you may want to put them in an air gap network. An air gap network is just a few computers connected by a handful of cables. And data can never leave that network because there's no cable and no nothing where they could travel out of the network, even if an attacker manages to run his code on your computers because you were curious enough to plug that USB stick you found on the parking lot into one of the computers. But as Jacek Lipkowski, as a radio amateur knows, a network cable is but an antenna by any other name. And if you can run code on the computer, you can use even a network cable as an antenna to send the data to places where they have never been before. Have fun with Jacek's talk. Hello. I'd like to present Etherify, bringing the Ether back to Ethernet. My name is Jacek Lipkowski. My hobby is amateur radio. I have been licensed since more than one fourth of a century and my call sign is Sierra Quebec 5 Bravo Papa Foxtrot. My hobby is also electronics, making and breaking networking systems and security. And I work at a financial institution in Poland. However, all opinions stated here are mine and not my employers. And in this presentation, I will talk about Tempest, also Soft Tempest, a bit about Ethernet, about Etherify, and show some demos. So Tempest is often treated as magic, but maybe we could have a peek behind the curtain and implement it something ourselves. So this phenomenon was first documented in 1943, during the World War II, Bell Lab technicians found out that uh, a teletype, which included a mixer, which was a cryptographical device, uh, which they sold to the military, caused electromagnetic interference. And this was nothing spectacular. Most electronic or electric devices cause some radio interference. However, they found out that they could recover plain text from it. And it could be recovered via uh, over a quite a large distance. Which was quite bad during the war because the war effort used a lot of this uh, equipment. And on the left, you have this teletype, which is just an uh, old type of serial terminal with a printer. And on the right is this mixer device. It's just a device that does exclusive R with a keystream, which is un provided on paper tape. So this problem was rediscovered in, by CIA in 1951 and on the same equipment, and this time it got a nice code word. They called it Tempest. And soon they started to research it and found other channels, like acoustic, optical, and so on. But the problem of electromagnetic interference isn't new. Mm. So it's quite possible that somebody else discovered it, we don't know who, when, and if it was used for anything. So Tempest is a code word, but it's often used as a single word to describe the phenomenon of data leaking out of devices via radio or some other channel. And this was officially declassified in 2007, so it's 64 years after the initial discovery, so somebody li li really wanted to keep it secret. And also, of course, civilians discovered this phenomenon. So in 84, Vin Van Eck showed that it's possible to eavesdrop remotely on computer monitors. 
and so he would just pick up the radio interference caused by the monitors at a distance, add some uh, synchronization to it, connect, feed it to uh, his own monitor, and he, he could basically watch somebody's screen from uh, a large distance. Now, Una Raisanen has a very nice video mm, of her implementation of a uh, Tempest receiver, which works uh, with an HDMI uh, HDMI monitor. So this is, this still works, and this th there's a link at the end of this presentation to her video. Now, side channels are very popular right now because people use it to recover secrets from cryptographic devices and by monitoring for example radio emissions or power consumption or other things and it's just like tempest but the concept is the same just the distance is usually much much smaller because they try to receive it at a distance of a millimeter or less what are these side channels there's the original electromagnetic side channel. There is also the acoustic side, side channel, the optical side channel, channel, thermal and others. So what is Soft Tempest? Soft Tempest is modifying Tempest properties by software put on, the, on, the, on some device. So for example, this software could use these side channels to intentionally leak some secret from uh, from uh, this device. Or it could also be used as a countermeasure. Uh, so this software could lower or mask emissions uh, so the adversaries will have less uh, less uh, will be less able to receive these signals. So tempest is a phenomenon which is uh, associated with military or espionage agencies. So what do I care, right? But actually people do have devices which are not connected to the internet and they have some secrets on them so for example one such device would be would be an hsm or a simpler device would be a dedicated workstation which would be used for a poor man's uh, certificate authority many people keep unconnected workstations as use which they use as cas and also high-risk fa facilities often have air-gapped networks or systems, like factories, for example. And also this phenomenon can be used for defense. For example, to make it harder for, to, for interceptors. One example would be Tempest fo fonts in the Tails uh, Linux distribution. And also it's, it can be used as a fun experiment because you can see how long, <coughs> what is the distance that you are able to exfiltrate the data from your devices and then assume that probably your adversaries will be able to do it at least 10 times further or much more even. And there is a lot of research in academia. If you want to read only one article about it, I would really recommend reading the presentation from Black Hat two years ago. It's called the Air Gap Jumpers. And it's from uh, the University of Negev, Israel. They have a lot of very, very interesting Tempest and so Soft Tempest work and they do publish it. And one example of such research is GSMEN, data exfiltration from air gapped computers over GSM. So in this, pu in this publication they use a malware on a PC, 
a receiver in GSM phone baseband software, but unfortunately there is no source code, no raw data, and nothing that we could really use to reproduce it, right? It's great that they publish it and it's unclassified, but still it's not as easy to use for amateurs. And Academia also has grants, they have access to expensive equipment, herds of professors and so on. There is one shining counter, counter example, it's called S Screaming Channels, it's a publication about extracting keys from Bluetooth devices, and it's, it has its source code published, has raw data published, there's a very nice how-to to show how to reproduce the results. And this is really how this research sh should look like. But unfortunately, this is a rare exception. It's not the norm. Most uh, publications are like the previous example. So how does military research look like? Actually, we know almost nothing about it. I'll show a declassified paper from 19, from the 1970s. It was declassified in 2007. And even though it's an old paper, you can see the first page is okay, second page is okay, third page, uh, th third page, ha page has half of it redacted, next page is redacted, and last page is redacted. So half of the document is actually redacted. So they really want to keep some things secret, even if it's from the 1970s. But sometimes we get a leak or two, which is also nice. We can assume that probably they have an unbelievable amount of money, equipment which is totally out of this world, battalions of professors and so on. And this is a military Tempest research team. And this is us, amateurs. We have no funds, we have no expensive equipment. Often we don't know what we are doing even. Hello, however, we don't know that something cannot be done, so sometimes we do it anyway. We also have cheap software-defined receivers, zip ties, silver tape, and all of the things that make engineering work. And so let's just have a go. Let's try to do a few simple soft tempest demo and see what we can achieve. And we will be using this receiver. It's just a dongle used to receive television, but it can be repurposed as a software defined receiver from that is able to receive from 24 megahertz to 1.7 gigahertz so it's quite a lot and it costs less than 20 euros so it's really technology available to everyone and on the right you see my tempest receiver which was used in some of these work so let's try to make, s find a like, side channel. It should be quite easy. You pick a bus, which is clocked in the megahertz range, the more the better, because it radiates better, usually. Mo find a way to modulate it in, s in some way, like turn it on or off, or change frequency or whatever, and see if you can receive it at this uh, clock frequency, or, or its harmonics. Unfortunately, it's not that easy because devices cannot produce a lot of electromagnetic interference. And so the all clocks are often uh, spread, spread spectrum modulated or the equipment is shielded for compliance reasons. Now, one such interesting bus and common bus is Ethernet. 
and right now I mean just simple Ethernet, right? Over normal cables, not over fiber, not over coaxial cable. So this Ethernet cable, which is called UTP, unshielded twisted pair, it's just four balanced lines. There's also a var variant called, called STP, it's uh, shielded, so less radio interference leaks out, but it's more expensive. And there are three basic variations of Ethernet. 10 megabit Ethernet, this uses a 20 megahertz clock. 100 megabit ether Ethernet, this uses a 125 megahertz clock and 1 gigabit ethernet which uses also a 125 megahertz clock but it uses a different encoding and all four pairs simultaneously and <coughs> ethernet devices offer are split into two parts one is the mac part which is the device that produces the ethernet bitstream and the other is the phi, which is the thing that inter interfaces this bitstream to the physical layer, like to the copper cable or fiber optics or whatever. And there is a standardized interface be between these two parts, which is called uh, MII, Media Independent Interface. And for one gigabit, there are three types of MIIs. One is GMII, the clock is uh, for 10 megabits is two and a half megahertz. The clock for 100 megabits is 25 megahertz, and the clock for gigabit is also is 125 megahertz. There is also RGMII, which is a reduced pin count version. The clocks are the same, and there is also SGMII which always uses a 625 megahertz clock. And the Raspberry Pi, which we'll be using in our experiments, has an RGMII interface. So, let's try it. Now, Ether is a, is a term called uh, which is of ether is a t term which was associated with radio. It was this imaginary medium that enabled uh, enabled electromagnetic waves to propagate, which physicists will try w were trying to find in the 19th century. So Ethernet is wired, but maybe we could put some ether into it and it will be wireless again. So, Let's try some simple modulation, changing the speed via ETH tool. So we will assume that bit one is is uh, that one is 100 megabits. Zero is uh, transmitted by setting 10 megabits. And for encoding, we'll use Morse code for several re reasons because it's. First, it's easy to judge the signal-to-noise noise ratio by ear. Also, it is easy to decode it by ear, if somebody knows Morse code, and it's much better than software decoders. And also, it has added some additional hacking hack value. And to reproduce this, this demo, I used two Raspberry Pi 4s because it's hardware that anybody can get. If I used some other hardware, then people would, ha would have problems reproducing it. And there is a made, I made a primitive implementation as a shell script. Uh, so let's try to change the speed, receive the, try to receive a signal at the harmonics of the RGMII clock. And the result was quite surprising because I was able to receive it at 100 meters. So that's really, really a lot because most Tempest demos work for meters or even centimeters. So let's have a demo. We have two Raspberry Pis. 
our Tempus receiver on the right, and one of the Raspberry Pis is ru running a script that will be exfiltrating some data from it. Okay, so we're logging into one of the Raspberry Pis via a serial port. We have a gigabit link between these devices. And we will set it to 10 megabits and no, uh, no auto negotiation. Please listen closely to the audio. Okay, and now 100 megabits. Oh, and we have a signal. So every time a radio amateur has a device that can produce a beep, he will just try to send more skill with it, right? Now again, turned off, turned on, quite readable signal. This is at 5 meters, by the way. But there is a lot of interference because this was in a area with a lot of Ethernet. Okay, so we're now exfiltrating the contents of the file secret1.txt. You can hear the nice Morse code. And for the people that do not know Morse code, there is a Morse code decoder here. And the message is hello RC3. So we've successfully exfiltrated more data from an from an unconnected from a uh, Raspberry Pi not connected to the internet. We exfiltrated it via radio. at a distance of 5 meters. So let's try a different type of modulation. Let's leave the interface at 10 giga gigabits, but let's flood it with data. And for simplicity we'll just use the flood ping. And there is, a, of course, the implementation, the encoding is still Morse code, and the, there is a primitive implementation also as a shell script. And we will be also receiving at harmonics of the RGMII clock. I found out that 500 megahertz is the best frequency for this demo, and I could re assume uh, I could achieve uh, reception at 30 meters. So this is also quite uh, quite distant. So this is our demo again. This time, one of the Raspberry Pis has a script which will flood flood uh, the network with packets. So let's try it. As you see we have a one gigabit link between the devices. The receiver is set to 500 megahertz. And listen closely. There was a short beep, right? Try it again. Okay, we can retransmit something, so let's exfiltrate data. This time the file is secret2.txt. You can hear the Morse code. The signal drifts a lot, but it, it is readable by ear without problems. Uh, this decoder is not very good, but okay, it's decoding also. And the secret message is start to the world. So we have successfully exfiltrated data by flooding the network with packets. Okay, so 
I was researching this phenomenon and by accident I haven't plugged I didn't plug a cable in and surprisingly I was still able to receive a signal from the Raspberry Pi and it turns out that if I put a Raspberry Pi at my balcony at home I'm able to receive it at 50 meters which is really a lot single un unconnected device no Ethernet cable so the Raspberry Pi 4 really generates a lot of interference or at least the units that I have I will have to try it on another batch uh, and unfortunately this makes Ethereum Phi 1 and 2 less spectacular so oops right uh, but Raspberry Pis are probably quite uh, representative of uh, other embedded devices so this is probably this this is probably also this probably also happens in other embedded devices however I haven't checked so let's have a demo we have a single unconnected Raspberry Pi there's no Ethernet cable connected to it and it runs a shell script okay so no no Ethernet link and we'll set the speed to 10 megabits and now to 1 gigabit very nice signal right at 375 megahertz so let's exfiltrate data this time it's secret 3.txt very nice Morse code good signal and the message is Raspberry Pi's dirty little secret. Okay, so this is. Uh, you can we can see that uh, Raspberry Pi's are quite unique. Maybe we could try some other device. And so I made Etherify four. It was a. I tried to implement Etherify one and two on different hardware and in this case it was Dell laptops I have two Dell laptops which are I know that they are mm, they don't pr produce a lot of electromagnetic interference so they're quite they're quite good in this res respect unfortunately most Ethernet hardware uh, brings the link up after several seconds after changing the speed so this is bad for transmitting regular Morse, Morse code but we can do something which radio amateurs call QRSS CW which just means very very slow Morse code and this is Morse code which uh, has the dot length, length of the dot in their or order of several seconds and as, as usual we'll receive at harmonics of 125 megahertz and we will decode the Morse code visually from a slow spectrogram. And at the bottom of this slide, you see that that uh, changing the interface speed changes the sum clock. When it's 10 megabits, it it's it has a higher fre frequency and t tends to turn drift upward, while when it's 100 megabit, it tends to drift downward and has a lower frequency at least this is how it works in these two Dell laptops and you can see, see the dot dash four dots and so on on the spectrogram so let's have a demo again two laptops connected via ethernet one of the laptops has a script that will exfiltrate some data from it so you can see the spectrogram 
the audio from the from the SDR receiver is fed into a program called, called Spectrum Lab, which does a very slow spectrogram of the sound. So over here you see an dot, then a dash, four dots, which is this is E, T, H, and so on. This demo sends the word etherify. And you can see that the data <coughs> transmission speed is very slow, but it is possible to exfiltrate data. And this demo was done at a distance of about three meters. So, if we are able to transmit on normal hardware, maybe we could try it on something else, and maybe on networking equipment, which is quite interesting. So I took two Linksys 1 gigabit switches and connected them via, via uh, gigabit Ethernet, via uh, an, an Ethernet cable, and made a small script to change the speed via SNMP. And as usual, we'll listen to harmonics of the RGMII clock. In this demo, I found that five, 50 megahertz is okay. It's a, the best frequency to listen to this signal. And on the bottom of the, bottom of the slide, you can see the signal. This was received at a distance of about five meters. So you have a dot, dash, four dots, dot so it just sends the word etherify again and this these switches behave quite differently from the uh, Dell laptop right it's just different hardware doesn't you don't see this drift over here and so on so let's have a demo two switches co linked via an ethernet cable and some workstation that has a script that will change this uplink, uh, this uplink speed via SNMP. This time the receiver is tuned to 50 megahertz. The speed is set to either 10 megabits or 100 megabits and the signal is present when it is set to 100 megabits so as you see the signal is the s data rate is also very slow but it is possible to send exfiltrate some data And I promise I will try it on, dif on a different uh, device some, sometime. This can also be uh, implemented via scripting, uh, via scripting facilities in switches. For example, Cisco switches have a TCL interpreter in it. Okay, so enough of radio. Uh, Initially, this was supposed to be a collection of soft Tempest demos, showing how to exfiltrate data via different channels. Unfortunately, I got too focused on radio because I like radio, but I did a quick hack uh, to transmit data via ultrasound. This is absolutely nothing new, but I just wanted to find what, find what distance I could achieve. So in and I named this Sonify. The implementation is again is as a simple shell script. S the sound is transmitted via the laptop speakers from a Dell one the laptop and re received via the via the internal microphone in another laptop. Now the hearing range of uh, humans is up to twenty kilohertz. And 
most and this is really it's really rare that somebody can really hear 20 kilohertz so usually it's more like 16 kilohertz and the uh, sound card in most laptops has a sampling rate of at least 48 kilohertz so that means that it is possible to produce a signal of a frequency of up to 24 kilohertz or half of the sampling rate so we can use the whole sp sound spectrum from the top of the human hearing range or 20 kilohertz up to 24 kilohertz to transmit data and i've had a very good result at 21.5 kilohertz this was just arbitrarily picked frequency I could receive a clear signal at 20 meters. Now this can be extended with a ultrasound uh, directional microphone, but even the internal microphone in the laptop works really good. So let's have a get demo again. One laptop transmits sound to the other laptop via ultrasound. This is by the way nothing nothing spectacular. It has been demonstrated multiple times maybe not with Morse code but with other technologies okay so this is the audio spectrum and we'll be exfiltrating data from one of these laptops and the receiving laptop is at uh, 20 meters distance this program which is running right now which is called spectrum lab also written by a radio amateur shows the spectrogram and also converts the sound uh, the 21.5 kilohertz sound into 60 650 hertz so that we can hear it by ear and you we can see that the decoder is struggling with receiving this signal okay but right now it got a decode right so the message is ultra rc3 sound so we have successfully exfiltrated data via ultrasound this is still a work in progress i'll have to test um, the ethernet the etherify demos and other hardware also I'll have to look at the data encoding uh, because it is possible to influence the spectrum of the transmitted radio signal by changing the data which is sent uh, and this is there is a demo which does this it's called ispthernet it's a uh, it's an implementation of ethernet uh, on an ESP32 processor and this is not real Ethernet hardware it's just an implementation using the processor spin pins and in this demo they uh, because Ethernet is uh, 10 megabit Ethernet is uh, Manchester encoded so if you send a data con con uh, containing all zeros it will send an ether alternating stream and if you send a data mm, uh, data uh, con uh, containing only uh, containing one zero one zero one zero one zero it will be the manchester encoding will uh, encode it in a different way so mm, okay one other uh, thing I would like to look like is the networking uh, cards, networking interfaces, and especially the, the Intel E1000 inter in, uh, network card because it's present in most laptops that I have. And it has some registers that uh, set PLL settings, uh, clock frequencies. I haven't even looked into it, but uh, but it's prob probably it's possible to change some frequency or do some modulation with it and also I'd like to implement some other soft tempest demos like optical 
and of course keep them as primitive as possible so that people can reproduce it easily. So try it yourself. Get a cheap RT SDR dongle. If you s still don't have one, there's absolutely no reason not to have one. Buy it, it's really cheap. And try one of these demos. And also remember that these demos are deliberately as primitive as possible. So it's easy to uh, understand them and it's easy to reproduce them. This is a, just a fun demo, it's not a military data exfiltration exercise. If an adversary would like to do it, he will probably do it in a much more advanced manner. Also read the literature, it's a lot of fun. And if there are any questions, I'd really like to answer them. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Jacek, for that talk. We are a bit over time, but we may squeeze in a few of the questions. Um, one question we've got is, um, which component of the Raspberry was actually emitting the signal if it wasn't the cable? I don't know for sure, but uh, it's probably the RGMII uh, interface. <laughs> But uh, I, I must say that it's the signal is surprisingly strong, and there is also you can see there I have a YouTube video with absolutely nothing connected to the to the Raspberry Pi, uh, uh, only a power bank, and it's still I'm still able to receive uh, the um, I'm still able to receive the signal at 50 meters. So it's really a surprisingly strong signal. But it, I think it's the RJMII clock. So the the lines between the between the uh, Broadcom chip and the uh, and the Phi. And another question: Did you try the flapping method on another device than the Raspberry? Yes, I have. Uh, this is a work uh, in progress, and uh, some things are still not documented. I will be uh, publishing them. And. Um... The first experiment is, experiments were with unshielded cables. Um, do shielded cables make much of a difference here? Uh, yes and no, because uh, in the case of the Raspberry Pi, we can see that the, actually it's not the cable, it's the, it's the Raspberry Pi that does the radiation, the radiating. So uh, it wouldn't, it doesn't make, because I've, obviously I've done such, such a test, and it doesn't make uh, as much of a difference. Uh, however, with normal hardware, like with laptops or with switches, it does, uh, it does make a difference, quite a difference, but it's still, I'm still able to receive it, but just the distance is not that, not, not that large. And a uh, question that just came in, uh, I guess you tested this under idle conditions. How well does it work under real life busy conditions if there are other applications running? Uh, well, with switching speed, it's not it's not a it's not a problem because it's just the speed that that changes. This might be a problem for the applications because it uh, disrupts the communication for a, for for a, for a while. Uh, but in case of uh, in case where uh, I modulate the bandwidth. Uh, I mean the the traffic, like the flood ping, uh, it it depends on how much the applications generate, uh, how much traffic the, the applications gen generate. So, for example, if I have an application that uses uh, one megabit of traffic, and uh, all of a sudden I start use, using uh, 10, uh, 100 megabits of traffic, this will be detectable without problems. And another more general question, as a total beginner on high frequency stuff, could you give any advice on how to analyze the obtained signals, for example, which programs are there are and what can help, for example, generating visualizations? Yes. Uh, first of all, get the uh, television dongle, the DV DVB-T dongle. It's really, really cheap and there is no excuse for not having it. Uh, any software-defined receiver, 
so for example in linux there is G gqrx which i'm using in uh, in uh, these demos and for analyzing the audio further, for example, uh, uh, showing the slow spectrum, I use a program which is called uh, Spectrum Lab. And, but this is an answer which is uh, only pertaining to this uh, presentation, but a more general answer would be to uh, try uh, software like Universal Radio Hacker or stuff like that if you're trying to for example uh, analyze uh, i don't know remote controls or stuff like that there's really a lot of material but first try just a simple software defined receiver like gqrx or sdr sharp or something like that okay thank you for your talk and for being here to answer the question the signal angel just wrote that there was much applause from the chat in bold with an exclamation mark which I think is well deserved. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. And it was an honor to present at this conference.